Okay. Today I'm going to show you how to make a microtubule network. Um, we're going to add kinase into this and put it on the confocal and see what it does. Alright, I'm going to show you how to make kinesin clusters. These are uh, kinesin motors that we artificially um, stick together so that they can walk on adjacent microtubules and produce activity. Lots of fun. And it's a very simple protocol compared to the myosin, which you may have seen. Alright, so I've labeled a tube here, K clusters, for kinesin clusters. Open it up. First thing I'm going to put down is our PEM buffer, 7.07 microliters. Here we go. You saw nothing. All right, pen buffer. Depress my pipette. Draw. Take it out. Looks like about seven. That's good. Carefully add. And then dispose of my pipette tip. Okay, next thing I'm going to add is my kinesin motors. You want to make sure when you're labeling your tubes that you distinguish kinesin motors from kinesin clusters because if you don't do that, um, you won't see any motion in your sample and you'll be very confused as to why. Um, this is kinesin. It was stored in the minus 80. Um, you want to be sure that if you have multiple different batches of kinesin that were prepped separately that you know which one you're grabbing from because um, the experiments and the concentrations of kinesin can be very batch dependent. So be sure to double check that when you're writing down your protocol for the day. Alright, it's asking me for 2.71 microliters of that. Dial it down. 2.71. Alright. Stick it in. 2.71. Right, motor's back on the ice. Add this to my pen buffer. Good. And then next thing I'm adding is my neutravidin. Neutravidin is just the molecule that sticks together the two kiny the two kinesin dimers. Um, it's been pre-diluted in PEM buffer to what it specifies here in the protocol. Um. Hmm? Oh, I was just going to say show the ah, yes. stuff to the camera. But, yeah. Yes. Neutravidin aliquot, pre-diluted. Dial down the pipette to 0.72 microliters. Point seven two is much lower than you think it is. That just has to do with how the pipette tip is shaped. All right, carefully add that in. Make sure everything gets in there. You're pipetting these tiny volumes. You want to be sure every bit of it gets in because it matters a lot more <laughs> when you're working with tiny volumes. All right, last thing we're adding in is DTT. It's just an anti-sticking agent. It's been diluted. 1 to 100 from 1 mg per mil stock. We want 1.5 microliters of that. It just stays liquid at room temperature. Alright, then that is pretty much all the reagents that you need to add to these. Now I'm just going to dial up my pipette to the max, about 10. This whole um, solution is about 10 microliters, so mixing at 10 should be about good. All right. Now I just gently draw from the bottom, and then pour down the sides. Try to get minimal bubbles in your samples. You'll get better at it with time. Just mix it up until you don't see any um, inhomogeneities. You just want everything to be nicely combined so that we can incubate this on ice for at least 30 minutes before we add it to a sample. And then all of our motors will be formed into clusters. Right. Close it up nicely. Throw it on ice. 
and you're good to go. Okay, so we're just going to make a microtubule network. Essentially what that entails is we're gonna add fluorescently labeled microtubule dimers to a sample with buffer and polymerization agents, and we're gonna let it incubate for 30 minutes, and then we can put it under a microscope and see what that looks like. So the first thing we always add is our buffer. It's always important to add the buffer first. So we add 6.6 .6 microliters of pen buffer, dial our pipetter, and add it to a tube, which you've been sure to label with microtubule network or something else descriptive so that you know what it is. All right, next thing we add is 1% tween. Uh, tween is just a surfactant. It prevents nonspecific binding. 2.5 microliters. Five. Add that right to our pen. Okay. The next thing we add is 5.32 microliters of 48 labeled tubulin. That means that the microtubule dimers are labeled with a particle that fluoresces when 48 light is shined on it and then emits at um, a longer wavelength, which will be green. All right dial my pipetter to 5.32 there isn't enough in one aliquot because we make our aliquots around three microli microliters large so I was sure to take a second one out of the minus 80 for this particular network Add that to the sample. Okay. Uh, the next thing we're adding is one microliter of 100 millimolar GTP. GTP is what causes the microtubule dimers to polymerize. Um, one microliter. And then if you get any small droplets like this in your sample, be sure to just gently guide them down to um, the volume of the rest of the sample, just so that we can make sure that anything that needs to be in our sample for polymerization gets in there. You don't want your concentrations to be off for reasons like that. Okay. Next thing we're adding is 8.33 microliters of 100 millimolar ATP. Technically, you don't need ATP to polymerize microtubules. Um, we generally add it in before polymerization so that if we have actin in our network, then the actin will polymerize and it is also going to drive the kinesin motors in our network. So, 8.33. Okay, adding the ATP very gently. And then the very last thing we add is Taxol. So the Taxol stabilizes the microtubules, it prevents them from treadmilling. And um, it's stored in DMSO and it's also diluted in DMSO, so it'll just need a second to defrost. Try not to defrost your Taxol too many times, just treat it as a single day use. And if you ever forget, um, how many times you can use some reagent before you need to throw it away or how long you need to um, how off frequently you need to replace it if you're just keeping your reagents on ice over several days for multiple experiments you can always refer to um, this spreadsheet you put it? <laughs> oh thanks yes yes I'd keep a spreadsheet like this in your lab notebook it has every reagent that we use for cytoskeleton things um, the storage area, a short description of its purpose, typical aliquot size so that you can know if you're making trips at the minus 80 how many you should bring for a protocol, typical stock concentration, 
its lifetime and any precautions you need to take. So when in doubt, take your spreadsheet out. All right. <laughs> you can cut that later. Okay. 1 to 20 taxol. We need 1.25 microliters of that. And then finally add that to your network. Now you'll notice that since the taxol is in DMSO, it has a different refractive index than the rest of your sample, which is mainly in water. That's actually a very good indication when you're mixing your sample because you want to make sure that you've mixed your sample enough times so that it's visibly of the same refractive index. You don't see any more little lines in there. And these are just um, monomers. I guess dimers they are technically, so you don't have to be very careful about slowly, slowly pipetting as you would post-polymerization when you take out your network. You're not, you don't have to worry about ripping up the network itself yet because it's just monomers, but do be gentle. Just take, draw slowly from the bottom and then add back to the side. And then just do that until you see no visible inhomogeneities in the sample. Try to get in as few bubbles as possible. Okay, it's about good. And we're just going to put that in the 37 degree heat bath and we'll let it incubate for 30 minutes. All right, here's a 37 degree incubator. Make sure, one, it's actually at 37 degrees. Sometimes it'll get set to something different if people are doing other things. Another thing you want to look at for here is the, um, the metal plate where you actually be putting in your, um, your sample, but you see that this is made for the larger centrifuge tubes. So you always want to make sure that you use the appropriate size um, holder for these because it'll ensure uniform heating. So carefully take out this metal block here and then add your other one in. You can give it a minute to heat up, but really the microtubules can live fine at room temperature for a bit before polymerization. Just make sure that so you'll see that it's indicating the temperature now is a little bit lower. It says it's still within a decent range, however. It'll heal, heat up slowly, but maybe just give it two extra minutes of um, polymerization time to ensure that it gets a full 30 minutes at 37C. All right, write the time down on your hand with a Sharpie. and be sure to be back there in 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, see you in All right, our network is polymerized. We have it right here, fresh out of the incubator. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare our sample for imaging. So that just involves addition of the motors and a few additional things like our, um, our system that we add in there, our oxygen scavenging system, which prevents photo bleaching. Okay, so I'm taking out 7.5 microliters of the polymerized network. Okay. And then I transfer it to another tube which is labeled as sample for imaging. Okay. Then the next thing I'm going to do is add my oxygen scavenging system, glucose oxidase catalase, and glucose. And I've actually pre-mixed those two components. You might not necessarily do that in your protocol, but I'm going to add 0.75 microliters in the solution. Carefully. And then I'm going to add 
2.25 microliters of PEM buffer that just fills extra volume essentially to get our sample to um, the dilution that it needs to be. And then the last thing I add is the kinesa clusters. And you just want to add that last to have the most control over when your sample starts the activity. Two microliters out of what we prepared before. Okay. And then since our network is polymerized, you want to take care to um, pipette it very gently. So when we're pipetting to mix, dial it up just like before. And then just be a little bit extra gentle when you're pipetting up and down. Very slowly, very controlled. From the bottom and on the side. Just do that a few times. Now draw up some amount of it, about eight microliters should suffice. And then I'm going to load it into my slide. This is a pre-prepared chamber. I'm going to do is I'm gonna just drip a little bit on the top. There's no jamming of your pipette tip into your chamber. You just use the capillary action a little bit up here and you should be able to see it's flowing down slowly. And you can control the rate at which it flows down roughly with the angle of your slide. So just put a little bit on, let it flow down, a little bit on, let it flow down, and then let it reach the other end. And maybe even a little bit extra if you can. Okay. This is what it should look like. Ideally you would want no bubbles in there as that can lead to drift. And then you can always have a little bit of sample hanging over on each side because you can always just wipe that away. Okay. And then you prepare your epoxy. Get my fancy little epoxy swirl right here. And then this should ideally dispense an equal amount of epoxy and hardening agent. You don't need very much at all. This one sucks. I don't know. Let's use this one instead. Okay. You want to try to get the same amount of epoxy and hardening agent right next to each other. That much should suffice to seal one chamber. Even more, actually. You don't want to pour out too much epoxy because then it's just kind of a waste. Okay, then you combine them, mix them all together. The better mix they are, the faster the hardening will be, and the sooner you can get on with your experiment. Okay. And then you take that up onto this pipette tip, and then you can angle this away from the side on which you're adding the epoxy, and just make sure you have enough on there to make a seal. It doesn't need to be pretty, you just need to make sure it's all sealed up nicely. Okay, and then the other side. And alas, here we are. All right, let's go image it on the confocal. Okay. All right, so I'm imaging my sample on the confocal now. You'll see that when we're in the sample, our microtubules are, like, are labeled in green, and you should see something like this, a nice homogeneous network, lots of nice filaments here. You'll always see clumps like this, it's okay. If you see larger scale clumps, it may be indicative of a problem, like a reagent going bad or something along those lines. And I'll take a quick time series so that we can see a gist of what kinesin activity should look like. Let's just give it a second to acquire. 
let's let it run for a few minutes. Okay, so a question I get asked a lot is with these active samples, how do you tell whether the sample is just drifting due to a leaky chamber or if you're actually seeing activity? With kinesin especially, it can be a bit difficult to tell because kinesin will tend towards large-scale uni unidirectional motion. But one way to tell is just take a five-minute video like this. You'll see that overall, you see a net upward motion of the entire sample, but you also see noticeable smaller scale events, such as, for example, this part of the network kind of clustering. And you also see that the motion is not uniform across the whole field of view. So for example, this part contracts upwards a little bit faster than here, and then you kind of have larger scale separation of different clusters of the network.